Wherefore, Series 3, Episode 45. That there is definitely a portal at the top of the high street becomes apparent when the interdimensional spiders show up to deal with it. However, in this case, the spiders do not deal with the hole by sewing it shut. Instead, they set to work on shoring up the edges. The presence of the very large iridescent spiders makes the portal itself more obvious, but not more accessible. Positioned as it is amidst the disturbing metal to toadstools at the top of the street, where there is also a small playground, the location is attractive to children. They are divided evenly between those who scream and flee and those who find the monstrous spiders add to the general attractiveness of the portal into the unknown. The spiders seem to have taken it upon themselves to keep children out of the portal. It is impossible to tell who they are defending from what. As there is clearly something going on, a watch station is set up next to the portal. This is basically a tent with a chair in it, but better than nothing on a wet or windy day. The wizards make very little effort to disguise it on the grounds that mostly people come and stare at the portal and the spiders, and anything else in the area is automatically a lot less interesting anyway. The idea is that the wizards will watch the portal. Often this kind of observation is handled by pigeons, ducks, jackdaws and other such helpers the wizards have enlisted. However, the birds want nothing to do with the portal. The spiders make them far too nervous. Given the size of the spiders, it is entirely reasonable to think they might eat birds. To further complicate things, a 24-7 watch rotor for a portal divided by eight wizards means everyone doing a three-hour shift every day for an unspecified amount of time, possibly forever. This plan is instantly not a hit, and it is as a consequence of this that the wizards start thinking seriously about people they know and are possibly willing to trust. It turns out to be quite a decent list, although it may be fair to say that not guarding a portal in the rain at three in the morning is a magnificent motivator for thinking of people who might do that instead. Even the wizard William, who is not unfond of standing around in the rain at lonely hours, turns out to know people who might be persuaded to do a portal shift or two. What was first intended to be a subtle observation strategy turns rapidly into a cheerful circus in which there is a steady supply of tea, rather a lot of people, considerable snacking, assorted small dogs and no discretion whatsoever. Being wizards, the wizards take it in turns to mutter in twos and threes about how other wizards really aren't taking it seriously enough. Bickering is very much part of the fun and finding reasons to be annoyed with each other is very much part of wizarding culture. It is late on a Sunday afternoon. Stroud High Street is fairly quiet at this point in the week. The wizard Wigston and Professor Bob Fry have a pair of old-fashioned stripy deck chairs, a thermos of hot water and a teapot, having long since agreed that bringing tea in a thermos would be barbaric. They have cups and a little jug for the milk. As it is quiet, they have fallen into a deep philosophical debate about the merits and attractiveness of various types of apple and are trying to establish the grounds on which you might judge an apple's intrinsic sexiness. As the tip of something emerges from the portal, the debate stops instantly. It is a small emergence, and while not inherently that exciting, it is the first thing to have come through. The spiders show no sign of trying to stop it. After a moment, a bit more emerges. Looks like a cow horn, Wigston pronounces. It could be a Viking emerging drinking horn first. Although that doesn't seem very likely. The horn emerges a little further. Clearly not a giant sloth elder god, Professor Bob Fry says. And it is apparent that he'd rather hoped it would be. Could it be the nipple of a giant elder sloth god, Wigston wonders. 
Professor Bob Fry is strangely confident that it could not. By this point, the horn has emerged far enough to rule out being the horn of any living creature either of them can actually think of. Wigston alerts the other wizards to the news that something is going on, but slowly, and that he doesn't really know how to explain. Wizards are oddly averse to mobile phones, so this communication is carried out by a series of rather bizarre activities, including burning bits of paper and being talked to by pigeons who are trying their best not to hang around on account of the massive spiders. The emergent horn is several feet long now and of considerable girth. Happily, it is not pointing towards the observers, and they feel quite at ease watching its curious progress. Could it be one of the horns on the great beast? Professor Bob Fry asks. They are, there are implications to the word great, after all, and this is clearly a beast of considerable magnitude. I do hope so, says Wigston. I would very much like to see it. And the Whore of Babylon. Further watching reveals that the vast horn is attached to a snout. So far, there is just the one horn. Fans of the great beast will be aware that seven heads and eleven horns are to be expected, but that no one can agree on how said heads and horns are to be arranged. A massive shoulder comes through, then a long leg, and suddenly the beast goes from slow emergence to sudden pace. It is a vast and thunderous blur charging off down the high street with its two human admirers chasing after it. They catch up with it a little while later at the bottom of the high street where it is cautiously nibbling at the yellowing leaves of the ginkgo tree. I do believe it's an elasmotherium, says Professor Bob Fry. How marvellous! Perhaps we can feed it a few conspiracy theorists, Wigston says, eyeing up the mouth of the creature and wondering about dietary preferences. They are notoriously fussy eaters, says Professor Bob Fry. It might be why they died out. We'll just have to look after it, says Wigston, whose fondness for ridiculous beings knows no limits. Just think, says Professor Bob, we could have Stroud Elasmotherium Day. Children could have rides upon it. Assuming it doesn't eat children, Wigston says, people always get upset if the megafauna eats a child. There is the kind of silence that happens when two people pause together to acknowledge a problematic truth. Of course, while all this has been going on, neither of them has been watching the portal, and the next shift of observers isn't due for a good half hour. No one knows what the spiders are doing right now, or what the portal is doing, whether this was the sole purpose of the portal, or whether this was just a distraction while the main event continues unobserved. We must hurry back up the hill. At the portal, the spiders wave their legs nonchalantly, as spiders tend to do, when trying to look innocent.